auto announcement has been paid for by the WZWA Network. Hey guys, this is Sean Oliver. You are watching the Insider's Edge podcast where you are going to find out how big it is. Hi everybody, this is former WWE superstar Al Snow. And Sean Oliver. My name is Eugene. And you are watching the Insider's Edge podcast. Now get on the train. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WCWA Network in conjunction with Blue Wire Hustle. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California in Fury. It's great to be with you all once again. And, and, and here tonight, I'm, I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity to interview a guy that I will consider a massive inspiration to me uh, as far as interviewing people within the wrestling business. I have seen literally... I'd say 99% of the releases that this man has been a part of. And uh, without any further ado, it is my honor to introduce the one and only face of kayfabe commentaries, Sean Oliver. How are you, my friend? See, you and about 12 other mental defectives feel that way about me. And listen, the 14 of us will have a nice little clubhouse together. I don't know how much uh, of the general listening or viewing public feels that way, but for anyone that does, it's an honor to be here. So where am I beaming down to? Uh, down under, right? Uh, right now? That's right, bro. Perth, Western Australia. Perth. Okay. So, uh, so the qualities of Perth maybe versus Adelaide or another area like that. What? Give me some. Give me some qualities of Perth. Uh, Perth is the only uh, city in Australia that gets to have sunsets. Uh, we are way better than Adelaide. Adelaide is a shithole. Um, but, you know, the, the the main thing that sucks about Perth is we are quite isolated. And when some big bands come to Australia, uh, it we tend to miss out because uh, it costs too much to bring everything over here. So... Um, being isolated kind of sucks, but on the other side of the coin, it's also good because we've only had one uh, case of COVID in public in the last 10, 11 months. So, uh. yeah, you guys have seemed to be able to keep this under control. We don't know what we're doing over here. And and I'm in my Florida place right now. So th this entire state is a is a mess. But you guys have seen uh, seem to be able to uh, to manage this. Why? I think we just got in real quick and we got everyone locked down real quick. And uh, everyone that uh, had contracted the virus went straight into quarantine, into the hotels and everything. And, you know, we had, mm, I'd say maybe eight to 10 weeks where everyone had to stay at home unless that they were, unless they were a necessary worker, like at a supermarket or pharmacy and things of that nature. Um, so I think we just got in real quick. We didn't dawdle. We didn't, you know, Let's see how this pans out. They just got straight on to it straight away. And, and the, the premier from our, I guess they'll become like a mayor in the US. He uh, was just very strict about everything straight out of the gate. And that's why we, we didn't have any community transmission for a good eight months. One security guard at one of the hotels had caught something and went out in public for like two days. And for some reason, no one caught it uh it's even amazing. though that happened so we're very lucky yeah that's um, amazing we're in the millions over here i mean it's it, we have a divisive we are a divisive people us yanks up here okay we are a divisive people that um there is a lot in society that if you are part of the team that says wow what a nice blue sky today they are programmed to say it's green it's green it's not blue it's not blue of course <laughs> you think it's blue you want to give money to all the poor people you don't want it you want to tax us so uh it's very nice to hear uh, a community that takes things seriously uh a, a, a premier or prime minister whatever the hell you said that uh that uh, takes one position uh, does not prevaricate says this is what we have to do get serious or get lost nice to hear and i'm glad you're healthy carl for god's sakes what would we Thanks, do sure. if you were falling ill <laughs> exactly and because of the whole lockdown situation that's why we ended up starting this podcast because we didn't have a lot to do and uh we were we were stuck in at home and here we are uh nearly a year later so anyway sean enough about me enough about perth i want to talk about you 
And first question we always ask everyone is, how did you become a wrestling fan when you were a young man? I saw Superstar Billy Graham on a giant black and white television set um, in uh, 1978, I guess. And um, it was uh, it was a spellbinding thing. There was the action in the ring, of course, which if you're, you know, eight years old, it's it's like uh, you're watching live superheroes fighting. Right. That's the that's the closest thing uh, to, to which I could draw a comparison because today with the popularity of all the marvel movies and all the superhero movies well the the 1984 well i guess if you're talking about the first time i saw wrestling the 1978 version of that was professional wrestling um it was the larger than life uh warriors uh, battling it out good versus evil and um but they were real you could yeah. go to the arena and, you know hulk hogan could walk by you and talk about that being a, a spellbinding moment. So, but I was hooked. I grew up in the New York area. So I, I was, I was a product of the Vince McMahon senior product. Um, and uh, it's, it's superstar Billy Graham seeing the action there and then hearing him talk, they did an interview segment. And that was kind of, that was the whole thing. It was the dialogue and the action. I mean, it's like a Hulk movie today, right? Uh, it was the dialogue and the action. They were both as captivating. I think everyone of my era, you're probably younger than I, but anyone born in the 70s who watched in the 70s and 80s, they got hooked as kids because of that superhero thing. Now, um, I, I think people of all ages watch because of the, uh, the death-defying uh, acrobatics. It's more like the circus now, yeah. whereas back then it was uh, very much a superhero story. And that's why so many youngsters, I think, got ensnared by it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for me, like the first show I ever saw was Survivor Series 1998. So I was hooked on larger than life characters. And that's why I haven't watched wrestling properly full time. And I would say 11, 12 years and I only watch the old stuff now. Um, so I get where you're coming from when I was a kid. Boom. It just, I was just amazed at everything and hooked from what are you then drinking? on. What are you drinking there? What is, is I'm drinking a nice, a nice Shiraz, uh, Australian Shiraz. Oh, you, boy, you are such the stereotype right now with the Shiraz wine. <laughs> you drink on camera. You're going to be broadcasting this, right? You, you, yep. Is this dangerous in any way? Okay. I, I, I drink, I smoke, on, you know, it's, this is the way I do my thing. You're, uh, <laughs> we're 12 hours apart, so I'm on my coffee here, my first coffee. <laughs> Fair enough, Ray. Um, so uh, what would you say is like your, your fondest memories being a wrestling fan growing up, like a, a storyline or, or some sort of angle that took place that really captured you the most? The angles that, you know, there weren't 45 angles a week either back when I watched it. There was, there was one, maybe two weekly broadcasts in the New York area. Um, they both focused on one maybe two storylines that lasted a long time so the big storylines that were the uh, the draws back then were uh like snooker and piper snooker and morocco actually first had a series of of uh good matches at the garden um jimmy snooker and roddy piper when piper beat him up on the piper's pit set and whipped him and um that was the uh that's what catapulted Jimmy to like superstardom, but he just, he, he, he could not work the stick at all, which was his only downfall. He would have been, I mean, forget about it. Uh, he, he would have been, and th th this is before, this is right before Hogan, right? So this is, right. I believe, was that, when was the, oh, maybe right at the same, actually around the same time, 84. So Hogan had just come in, but Jimmy, Jimmy would have been uh, over hugely if he could have uh, spoken in anything other than what can be described as bizarre cave wall allegory, uh, <laughs> which is what he spewed down on the microphone. Um, <laughs> so those angles, of course, like the build up to WrestleMania one with Hogan and Cindy Lauper and, you know, pop culture kind of smashing in and merging with professional wrestling too. That was certainly something that grabbed everybody. Awesome, man. Yeah. That, I mean, that would have been incredible to be a part of back then. 
uh, especially living in that area and being able to see a lot of it live yourself. Um, so, okay, we're going to do a little bit of a fast forward here. You're a wrestling fan through the 80s. You get to the 90s. I assume you're still a wrestling fan. When do you first become aware of the idea of the shoot interview? I saw what I think is probably the first one, which was with uh, New Jack. Um, it was an RF video, and it I, it was it just kind of happened by accident. I guess they were sitting around talking, and um, and they recorded hours of of New Jack. Now I'm going to have 65 trolls scream at me that it was actually you know Axel Rotten was the first one. Whatever I, I, the first one I saw that I thought was the first of its kind was the New Jack one. Um, and it was a, a very fresh concept because we had the sheets, right? We had the dirt sheets and we had the, the, the internet was in its infancy, but um, we would soon have um, like IATA, which was an early uh, online radio broadcast uh, 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 platform that uh, Dave Meltzer was uh, and Brian Alvarez had shows on and they would bring guests on and they would talk about the business from the inside. So that was the, that was the first thing. Well, wow, these guys are now free to talk about what was for so long protected. So the newer guys doing it, newer guys, meaning like a new Jack or a just incredible or a Shane Douglas was one thing, but then when the old timers would start doing it, that was something completely different because those were the guys that had to fight in the bars to preserve the integrity of the illusion. So to hear them come out, to hear Don Morocco sit there and talk about, you know, what was going on behind the scenes in the 70s and 80s, that was a whole other level. So I think I caught on right about when everyone else did, um, mid-90s, 95, 96. Um, seeing those old, uh, in the tape trading days, I think they call it now, uh, or the, the message board days when people would yeah. trade tapes online. And uh, we didn't get started until 2007. So yeah. the business had like a 12 year lead up uh, to when we came in. And the thing, Carl, that was amazing about it, and I credit all of our success uh, to, is the fact that nobody did anything with the business in 12 years, with that aspect of the business. It was still a tape trading uh, message board uh, underground kind of thing. Guys like us that wanted, we weren't just wrestling fans, but we wanted to know about the business. It's just, like it's a niche of a niche. It's like this many people. And so we yeah. would trade interviews, but nobody did anything with it in 12 years to bring it to a more mainstream, both visually, proper lighting, proper miking, writing. Um, and then also uh, to expand the reach a little bit. Nobody really did anything. So it was not hard when we came in and applied all that formatting to it. It wasn't hard for fans to say, oh, my God, what a breath of fresh air. It, it, the shoot interview has grown up. Exactly. That's what I was thinking when I was thinking about this interview. And I'm like, they changed the game. Like it was always just this straight one shot, monotone voice behind the camera asking 500 questions uh, for a seven hour shoot interview, um, about every single thing. And that, I, I like that. I like knowing every intricate detail of everything, but, um, you guys came in and you had different formats. You didn't just do the whole career interview. You had the, you shoot, you had your breaking kayfabe, you had your timeline. They're all, and, and it helps because, uh, you know, to do timeline, to, to focus in on a specific amount of time, I think that just gets even more information out there. And you really like, it's hard for me to explain, but you know what I mean. And yeah, so how did you, spend, you could spend two hours talking about just one year. Um, uh, um, get, like you said, getting information out there, being able to go through the minutia of that year. And if you were just covering someone's broad career for two hours or three hours, you would touch, um, superficially on, on a lot of things. That's actually what gave birth to the timeline idea. I was listening to an MP3 of somebody else's shoot with uh, Billy Graham, superstar Billy Graham. And they spent about 30 seconds on the decision uh, to, to switch the title. And I was like, I could do two hours just on uh, Billy winning and Billy losing the title and and, you know, uh, getting it away from Bob back, uh, uh, getting it to Bob Backlund and 
just, it, it was just, it was glossed over. So um, I said, you know, such a short amount of time dedicated to a title change. What if we just did a year? What if we just did this year? And that was, that was the genesis of it. Wanting to spend um, a, a, a concentrated amount of time on just one year in the business. And if you took the right guy, that was one of the secrets to our success that I talk about in my book, The Business of Kayfabe. Um, if you get the right person with the right year, that's the right person, right show. In, in timelines uh, situation, it would be right person, right year. But in general for a company, right person, right show. Each show kind of had its own identity in all of the series that we produced. So um, if you get the right person who was working at the top of the card that can talk about even stuff they weren't involved with for the year, whatever, 1984, um, we did Piper for 84. So of course he was front and center for so much of it, but he was so present. It meant he was going to be at all of the tapings of every show, um, most of the house shows. So he could talk about other things that were going on in the company too, because he was there. If you had someone on that was working underneath on the card, they wouldn't be able to be, they wouldn't have been privy to the production meetings or, or things that were happening, you know, with the top echelon. So right person, right ear. And that allowed us to go through a lot of that detail of which you spoke for timeline. Yeah. And that's why I loved it so much because you went through everything with a fine tooth comb. I love that saying. And, and that's what I like. I just like to get every little bit of detail. And I, I get mad sometimes when I hear some of these podcasts these days and they've got this guy right there and they ask this question, they give this answer and then they move on to something else. And I'm like, you had this follow-up question right there, dude, and you didn't get there. And now I don't, now I'm never going to know the answer to what I had in my head. But every time I watched a timeline, you always went the way that, um, I was hoping you were going to go, even if it wasn't in your script, you always seemed to know you were thinking what I was thinking. And you went down that road, you branched off here, you branched off there. That's why I loved it so much. I just wanted to, I just wanted to say that. Well, that was one of the, one of the reasons that we succeeded is when I sat down with a guest, um, I was of course directing it in my head. Um, it was already written. Uh, that's uh, to Anthony's credit, uh, the research and the writing that I was given as I sat down as host uh, made it pretty, uh, pretty fail safe. Uh, it would have been very hard for me to mess that mess up one of those shows because of how much preparation we had because of Anthony. But once I got there and I had to sing the song on stage, so to speak, uh, I reminded myself to become a fan again as I was hosting because I would naturally just be in the mindset that my viewer is going to be in and asking the questions and um, doing the things, going to the places that, uh, that the, like you just said, you, I was asking the things you wanted to know about. So, that's exactly how I did that was just by being a fan when I sat down and it, it was so easy to get lost in the other stuff. I mean, there's a full production going on around you and, you know, maybe there was a problem with the talent. Maybe there's a problem with the money. Maybe there's a problem with the agent. Maybe there's a, a, a travel constraint. Maybe we've got to get them out. I'm on a, I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a, a strict time schedule. It was very hard to switch hats like that, but I had to, because when it was time to host, I had to go to a different place. I couldn't be worried about that extraneous crap. I had to be you sitting there with them, uh, tra channeling you from home so yep. that I knew what you wanted to hear. And I'm glad to hear that it, it succeeded at least a few times uh, in, uh, in timeline episodes. For you. Absolutely, bro. Um, and you, you're speaking of, you know, there can be certain problems uh, as the interview is going on. Uh, and one thing I found through my experience in the last year was making that connection during the interview and figuring out how to get them. Uh, because, you know, they interviews are a dime a dozen with some, some professional wrestlers. They've done thousands. What am I going to do to make that connection? I, I'll be honest. I interviewed Eugene about uh, a month ago. I didn't get a connection with him. I don't know why I tried real hard. It just didn't happen. That's fine. Not against him. Um, but someone like too tough, Tony, I, I could tell from the get go, he was, he wanted to get this over and done with, but I made that connection with him. And when we got to an hour, 
he was like, oh, damn, bro, I, I could go another hour. I'm having so much fun. So I made that connection and it worked. Could you see sometimes when you're interviewing someone, I haven't made that connection yet. And then there will be a moment where, okay, finally it happened. There were, um, it was few and far between when I wasn't able to make a connection with a talent. I, um, I call it my superpower. I had a discussion when I was starting the pod, my podcast with, I had a discussion with, uh, with Scott Levy, with Raven. And I was saying that, um, that this is going to be my kryptonite. The fact that I've got to do this over a computer, um, yeah. and not sit in a room with someone and take any time to get to know them beforehand, because that energy and that trust is something that floats in the air and it doesn't go uh, through these wires here uh, as easily. So uh, it was one of my fears. And um, it, when we were on a set, A, it helped if I knew the talent, first of all, because they were already disarmed. They knew I wasn't going to try and get them to say something bad or screw them or make them look bad. Um, save for the handful of people uh, who said nasty things about me because they came in and looked bad already before they even sat in my chair. Uh, it wasn't my doing. But uh, when I could sit down and have dinner with someone first, when we when the crew could take them to sit down and, and have dinner and talk to them, that brought everything down. By the time we sat down, we were cordial. Um, we got to talk about people we knew in common, even if I'd not met them yet. Always tougher when we had to go cold. When And then when we had to go cold and on the set cold, that was terrible. Meaning I couldn't even meet them for 10 minutes when they got to the hotel, give them the pitch, have them go upstairs and then come back down. When they are walked into our room straight off a plane or straight from another interview by uh, an agent, and they sit down with me cold under the lights, sign the release, turn to me and start talking. It was, it was a huge challenge for me. Um, after a few minutes, I could tell that, that they knew they were dancing with someone who would be able to lead them even if they misstepped. And it had to do with our professionalism. It had to do with our research. It had to do with my superpowers. It had to do with all that stuff. It just kind of, it just all worked. It was just a magical thing. And that's hard with this type of communication. Yep, absolutely. I, I found it. And, uh, but I, I, I think I've done well with it because uh, I, I do my research very thoroughly. And uh, I think that's what impresses some of the, especially the old timers, because, uh, you know, I'm 34 years old and they don't expect me to know anything from back then. But when they mention, oh, we had, I wrestled this guy at this venue and I'll be, I'll tell them what the name of the venue is. And I'll be like, oh, wow, good on you, bro. Um, right. So uh, speaking of the, the pre-interview meal that you would have with the guys, I just wanted to ask, quick sidebar, what was the most fun pre-interview meal that you shared with somebody? Um, it's a good question. Uh, the, the, uh, they were all pretty, they were all pretty tame and, and businesslike. Everyone's always on their best behavior when you're out at a restaurant. My favorite meal with a wrestler was when we were coming back from the Howard Stern show with, uh, with the Sheik, and, uh, we went to a diner and he beat them on the check and pushed me out the door as I attempted to pay at the register, uh, <laughs> grabbed the owner in a, in a hug in an embrace and with the other hand pushed me out the door so that I, I wouldn't pay the check. He turned to the room, waved, walked out and no one realized no one paid. We get in the car and we're, you know, we pull out and no one has said a word. I'm sitting there like this and Eric, uh, the agent is driving and Shiki turns to him and says, breakfast good for price. And that became one of our, uh, our stock lines at kayfabe commentaries, breakfast good for price. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> now that you told that story, I remember hearing about it uh, from the audio book I bought of yours. Um, great story. Thank you, Sean. Um, so uh, who is somebody that you fe felt like you just couldn't get to open up to you? China. China's interview was like playing handball with a piece of macaroni. It was just, I could not get it to come back to me. Uh, right. She... 
in, in her defense, she was, uh, she was flying in from California. She'd been delayed. I, I don't know. I don't remember what happened, but the flight was like sitting on the tarmac for like five hours. And then, you know, it's a six hour flight. The whole ordeal was like a 12 hour flight. And this is one of those situations. She gets delivered to us after a, a, a hellacious uh, 12 hour flight and delay and ordeal. So maybe she was tired, but she wasn't very forthcoming. It was a you shoot too. I thought she'd be wild and woolly. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, more like an insurance seminar. Right. <laughs> um, one interview I wanted to bring up was this is this is a, a big turning point for me as a wrestling fan. It was kind of like a light bulb moment where I realized I've been believing WWE's narrative about shit for so long. Uh, it was your interview with Vince Russo and guest booker. And I remember I bought it and I said to myself, I can't wait to watch this. I can't wait to see these crazy ideas that this guy comes up with. This is going to be a good laugh. And I watched it. And as I was watching it, I was like, oh, he's pretty funny. He's a personable kind of guy. It's, I'm really like, I'm entertained by his personality. He's, he's really cool. And then he got to the part where he started to book what he would have done with the WCW invasion angle. And as the interview was moving along, I was like, hmm, wow, that's a, that's a fucking great idea. This is fantastic. I'm not going to tell everyone what it is because I want them to go buy it and watch it because if you are not a Vince Russo fan, this will probably change your mind because it is brilliant. Uh, so for me, all of a sudden, I just had this light bulb above my head. Oh, my God, all this time I thought so low of this guy, and now I realize he's the reason I became a wrestling fan, Survivor Series 1998. Uh, and he's, he's the reason why I fell in love with it. And he's also the reason why I fell out of love with it because the show wasn't the same anymore. Once he was gone, as years went on, they continued the way that he would do things with crash TV. But as time went on, obviously the creative process wasn't working out and that's when I stopped being a fan. But I just wanted to say that, that there was a moment on an interview that you had that completely changed my whole thought process and everything. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the booking of the invasion was given, not so accidentally, to both Jim Cornette to do on Guest Booker and Vince Russo to do on Guest Booker. So much had been made of the two of their divergent booking philosophies, let's say, that I thought it would be fun to have both of them cover the same angle and fans of I mean, fan, people are fans of Cornette now because of the personality, but uh, fans of Cornette's style and then fans of Russo's style could kind of put them side by side and it would make for an interesting sociological study, I thought. And um, that uh, if, if they are considered required viewing, uh, the guest bookers by both of them, then they should probably be viewed back to back. Yeah, good idea. I watched the Cornet one too, and I have to say I preferred, I'm a fan of Cornet too, but uh, I preferred Vince's version. I wasn't too hot on WrestleMania being headlined by Hogan and Dusty in 2001. Um, <laughs> I mean, it would have been, it would have been fun to see, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we're about 15 minutes away from You Shoot with Sean Oliver, so I'm going to get through some of these other questions here before we get there. I want to make sure we've still got time for it because it's uh, I, 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 I searched high and low for a lot of these people. Um, I wanted to uh, bring up Jamie Dundee. Um, I couldn't watch the whole thing. It was just, it was wild. And at a lot of stages, I didn't understand what he was saying. I actually got the chance to interview PG-13 uh, about six months ago. And uh, I asked Jamie about that. And I just thought it was important for me to tell you that after that day, Jamie says that he never drank alcohol again. Uh, he's never seen it. He's embarrassed by the way that he acted that day. He doesn't remember anything that he said or did on that interview. Uh, and it was like a turning point in his life where he's been sober for over 10 years now. Well, I'm happy we could help, Jamie. So <laughs> thank you for the show, because a lot of people talk about it. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you pulled it all together. I haven't spoken to Jamie since the show. 
I hear little things from other people. Someone just, uh, uh, it was uh, Conrad Thompson just uh, tweeted me the other day and said that he had just watched it for the first time <laughs> since it had been produced 10 years ago. And um, he's, he called it the, uh, the greatest thing he'd ever seen, not even <laughs> just in wrestling, but in, in any form of media. So, I mean, Jamie, good things came out of it. So, you know, that, that, that it has merit, even if just on that. Absolutely, bro. Um, so speaking of Comrade Thompson, uh, did podcasting kill the shoot interview business? Uh, I don't know how good things are going for RF or if high spots are still doing their thing. Um, but what are your thoughts on everyone giving their story away for free instead of saving it for a payday. Yeah, that's what started to happen. But <clears throat> to be very honest with you, um, I, I don't think you can necessarily compare the podcast with a well-produced shoot interview. Okay? It's so like a well-produced timeline versus a weekly episode of some podcast. I still don't think it's a, it's a uh, anything that's on par. Yeah. What the problem became is the cost of producing an episode of Timeline versus the weekly podcast uh, for somebody uh, having a guest on talking about the same thing. Those were quite disparate. So in order to spend, you know, three, four thousand dollars to do an episode of Timeline, you've got to recoup that money, which means people have to buy it. Yeah. It's got to generate revenue somehow, either through a subscription based channel or through an a la carte purchase. Um, and that's what stopped happening. So um, I don't think it was because people just gravitated toward the podcast. What happened was Netflix. And, and I credit, I credit, I, I, uh, I assign blame to that model. If you want to talk about the death of, of shoot interviews, uh, big production shoot interviews, You've got to look at that. You've got to look at the devaluing of entertainment because people all expect now to pay nine ninety five and get five thousand hours of programming. Um, if you're HBO, if you're Disney, and you have a catalog as such, and you can get a million people a month to pay your nine dollars, that's nine million dollars a month. So yeah, you can give you can give some entertainment for that. Uh, we are we are a boutique operation, so we were not on par with that. I never understood people would be like, oh. You're fourteen ninety nine, and you only offer you know two hundred shows on your subscription channel. I, I don't understand where these people were were coming from. Uh, you know, we do not generate the traffic that a WWE does. You can sustain your programming on ten million dollars a month. Uh, we're not making ten million dollars a month, so um, it was not a sustainable model for us. Even the subscription model, had we done that earlier we still would have had to lower our production bar considerably based on the amount of money, the, the amount of revenue we would have been generating versus selling a, a DVD for $20. Right. Um, thank you for the insight. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up was I, I really, I loved the original music that you guys had made for a lot of your shows, particularly the Breaking Kayfabe song. That's just some classy shit right there. Um, who was the guy that, that uh, you know, was there several people that helped with that? Or was there one particular guy that wrote the music for all of those things? Our guest booker theme was written by uh, a, a guy, Jeff Nilsson, who I knew, who was a musician. I was, um, I'd worked with Jeff. Um, I used his studio. He had a home studio. And uh, just in being with him, it was at, at the same time we were launching the company. Um, and uh, I said to him, hey, listen, would you be willing to, to license us something that you haven't published. Like just, you don't have to write us a song, but just something you've got laying around that, that I could cut and, and use for this show that I'm doing with this company. And that's how we got the guest booker theme. And then when we decided to spin off into the other shows, um, I realized we were gonna need, a, a if we had different series, we were also going to need um, music that was themed pretty specifically for each show. That's when we found Kevin McLeod. Kevin McLeod's an incredible talent, uh, a, a, a producer, a digital music producer who produces music for podcasts, commercials. I mean, you can license almost anything from him. He's got so many different 
uh, genres and uh, you, you can you can look by by mood by tempo it was it, it opened up a world to us where we were able to really to be very specific with the kind of music that we wanted to match with with the show so it was jeff nilson initially and then kevin mcleod wow great stuff that's cool man see that's that's the little itty bitty details that i like to hear about but there's one thing i think that is so underrated and that's how the the video would begin and this was my process. I'd be there. I'd have a cooler of beers right next to me here at my back table. I'd have maybe some chips or pretzels or whatever. Be all set up, ready to go. Okay, I've just got the latest timeline. Okay, uh, you know, press play. And I would drum along with the beginning of it. Go on. Yeah. Getting myself pumped up. It's get, get me pumped up for the interview. I just want to say that is completely underrated. That's good to hear. It's, it, you know, people don't realize the amount of thought you, that goes into something as simple as your, um, your logo theme, right? Yeah. You're right. It's starting the video. It should, it should suggest to you that something is about to happen. Yes. So all of the best ones from movie studios, you know, that were a kind of a cacophonous drive to something big. It, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a science. I'm glad you appreciated it. I know people that have had that on their ringtones. I've heard it at <laughs> events that people's ringtones would go off and it was our, our, our logo theme. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. No, it just pumped me up so much because I knew I was about to learn some shit that I didn't know before. Uh, you know, a lot of times when I listen to interviews I already, these people have been asked these questions over and over again, but I knew I was about to learn. So that was the best part. Um, before we get to you shoot with Sean Oliver, the last question before we get there is what would you say is your crowning achievement through the time you were, uh, you guys were producing your stuff? You know, would it be having the opportunity to sit there with Bruno San Martino? Would it be the opportunity to sit there with Gary Hart or, or a superstar, Billy Graham? What would you say is like your, that yeah we did really good and we got that guy that you know what's your sweet spot of the the well you mentioned the bruno thing and the bruno thing was was so necessary for us to do because of course he passed and and though we didn't know that was going to happen um we knew that a series called timeline that chronicled the history of that company could not not have uh bruno be part of it um, we lost other people before we could get them on. Like, how could we have a series called Guest Booker and we never had Dusty Rhodes on? Well, we lost Dusty before it could happen. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the Bruno thing was was special. Yeah, and I would say that the biggest crying shame, uh, I feel, was the fact that you never got to sit there with Pat Patterson. I would have really, I think that yeah, would have been. that was another one I tried desperately to make happen um, from afar at first sending him notices, missives, and a, a, a fruit basket from Harry and David, which didn't work. And then finally got to, to meet him in person when his book came out. And he was, uh, he was doing a convention that, that we were at. And I asked the organizer, can I have a few minutes with him in the conference room? I want to pitch guest booker. And he couldn't at the time because of the book tour and because of WWE. But I said, uh, uh, well, just, just keep it in mind. This is, this is something that you've got to do. Um, I think he did it with somebody else. He did, uh, yeah, I think he, well, he did an interview. He didn't do a guest book or he did an interview with somebody else. And then he was gone not long after that. Such a shame. Such a shame. Okay, Sean, we're getting to this time right now, bro. I worked my ass off to find some of these people. I had to, it's hard to find someone when, when you're going with like their moniker and it's not their actual name. Uh, but I've managed to find a bunch of people that would send in questions quite regularly on you shoot. So here we go. Sean Oliver, are you ready for your you shoot? Let's go. Okay. HBK's lazy eye says, Hey, Sean, how's it going? It's your old buddy, HBK's Lazy Eye. Back in 2018, I remember a Mikey Whitbread you shoot and a Just Incredible you shoot being advertised on your website, yet they were never released. What happened to those projects? And if they were filmed, will we ever see them? The Just Incredible <clears throat> was announced. We took questions. Uh, 
I, I believe it was written. And then he had a scheduling conflict. And I couldn't take a chance on it was one of those hairy things like, oh, might be able to do it this day, might be able to. And I couldn't take a chance. So we actually booked Mikey as the replacement to Justin's show. So Justin's was never shot. Mikey's was shot and it is in the can and we still have it. And I'm, I mean, you'll it, it will see the light of day once uh, we oh, uh, decide what the hell is going on with the band. So okay. it, we do have that's very exciting, bro, to know that there is actually something that I haven't seen yet. Um, and also, uh, HBK's Lazy Eye followed that up with, uh, um, he hopes that you get to be able to start doing things again. Um, and he wants to thank you for all your hard work. Uh, and also asks, who is your top of the list to interview if you got to come back? Um It would depend the show. I mean, would you want a timeline? Because then we could... We could find uh, one of the more modern guys to cover a modern era, like a CM Punk, someone who would be interesting mm. to talk to. And, uh, and yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah. But he could cover contemporary stuff and would be interesting. Not a whole host of guys you can say that about who can cover mm -hmm. contemporary product. I'm saying contemporary being the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, and still be an, an interesting, well-spoken, insightful interview. I think Punk would be one of them. So yeah, we'll, we'll say that for now. And HBK's Lazy Eye, thank you for giving one of the most vile, crass <laughs> monikers um, in the history of YouTube. So, appreciate it. <laughs> and I also want to give throw this out there. I, I tried to get in touch with Dusty's Ghost, but uh, never got a response from him. That was another kind That's of offensive... Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sergey from Russia asks, uh, how did you describe the YouTube concept for a wrestler before starting filming? Um, the, the times that we were allowed to do that, meaning that they weren't booked by Eric Sims, who would keep them in the dark uh, as much as possible before they got to our set. Um, I would say it, it is just, it's an interview conducted entirely by the fans. Um, some questions will be silly. Uh, some um, will be serious wrestling questions. But the thing that I always said to them before you shoot was have fun with it. The, uh, that was part of my standard in the chair pitch when I leaned over. And if that was the first time that I had to explain the show uh, for timeline, my standard was uh, a detail that you might think you being the talent that you might think is, is just a trite and maybe something not to talk about something that was said to you uh, in the locker room before you went out for WrestleMania. That's the stuff we want. You think it's trite. It was an average Monday. That's the stuff we lo we're looking for. Yeah. We know who won the match. We know you guys went, you know, 60 minutes and you did a thousand sixty minute Broadway's. We know all that stuff, but, uh, but that little detail that you think is just commonplace. That's the minutia that we're looking for, for timeline. So spit it out. If, if it is uninteresting, I'll cut it, but let me be the judge of that. So that's what I would tell them for timeline. Awesome, bro. Awesome. And, and me finding Sergey was incredibly difficult. I just searched keywords, Sergey, uh, kayfabe commentaries on Twitter, and I managed to find his Twitter. He doesn't use it anymore. I managed to find his email address by Googling over and over again. Was, and he could have probably just visited the White House and Sergey <laughs> from Russia would have been there uh, last year. <laughs> uh, and uh, my boy right up here is next. It's Salvatore in. Uh, and of course his question has to be a ridiculous one, uh, regarding Gabagool, um, do you New Jersey people call it that in a tongue in cheek, ironic way, you know, kind of like how John Waters is in the joke on the campy decor of his apartment, or are you guys just oafs who don't know any better, by the way, stop calling it gravy. It's not gravy. Okay. All right. So, all right. So Salter, these are important questions for, for, for Northeasters here. Um, it is sauce. It is sauce. It is sauce. The term Sunday gravy, Salvatore, uh, it is not just a description of the substance. It is a it is a ceremony. You sit down for Sunday gravy. And when you sit down for Sunday gravy, you have sauce. You get it? Sunday gravy is the event. Sauce is what goes on the pasta. I don't say gabagool. I've heard gabagool. Capicola is, is you know, I, I don't fall into the heavy... Gava deal, Gava and uh, let's what's the other one? Oh, you, you get uh, for uh, 
you get your appetizer, you get your galamad for your appetizer. I call it calamari, um, as any as any Italian would want you to, Salvatore. But I understand your concerns, and they are very well founded. <laughs> uh, up next, uh, my boy Smitty T Mockingbird, uh, Sean. Where the hell have you and Kayfabe commentaries been, and when are you coming back? Well, Smitty, I, I think I'm I'm more present in the marketplace uh, now than even when I was with uh, Kayfabe commentaries. I wrote six books, <laughs> three fiction, three about the world of wrestling. Um, I had a podcast for a minute there, which uh, you could, maybe you did write me, I don't know. This is the fifth podcast I've done in the last two weeks, and I got invited to a sixth one this morning. So I'm out there, Smitty. <laughs> uh, again, Sergey from Russia. It's the Fuck, Mary Kill, You Shoot edition. Tammy, Missy Hyatt, Maria Kanellis. Oh God! See when when the tables get turned and you have to say kill. Um, <laughs> very hard. I, I may need somebody as a guest again. Um, so uh, <laughs> so I'll 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 do, I'll do different labels for them. Uh, Maria, fantastic in, in all categories. Uh, a wonderful guest, wonderful human being. Um, Tammy is a great worker who, uh, if you hire, is going to deliver the product you expect. And then, who's the other? Oh, uh, Mr. Hi. Uh, again, uh, another great worker who, who knows her place in, the, in that business, uh, exploits it very well. I was happy as a business owner with all of their performances. And uh, yeah, I guess that's all I can say. <laughs> Fair enough, bro. Uh, Adam K asks, um, to ask you about, you know, how does Jim Cornette like his burger cooked at Yogi's? Um, I'm not sure it was a burger uh, that he, oh, you know what? It probably was a burger. I'm thinking of their menu. He wasn't getting pasta primavera. He wasn't getting a salad. Um, I don't think he would have gotten a chicken sandwich. Um, it was, yeah, it was probably burger. And I see Jim, I see Jim as a well done kind of guy. I have to confirm that. <laughs> uh, we've got three more to go. Uh, Salvatore M. Once again, uh, would you take it? Would you take financial advice or get a mortgage from a guy dumb enough to marry Ric Flair's daughter without getting a prenuptial agreement? <laughs> All right. So I just learned that this happened. I didn't know. I didn't know that they were married, but. Um, I think in the affairs of, uh, of the heart, uh, sometimes we, um, sometimes we invest, uh, our souls, uh, deeper than maybe is prudent. <laughs> uh, second last one, Sergey from Russia chimes in again. What was the perfect issue that you did in terms of how close it was to your concept of the show and who was also the most disappointing guest? Well, the China one was disappointing. Um, the uh, I, I, there were so many good ones. I mean, we we like I said, perfect guest, perfect right guest, right show. We did that very well. It's one of the things we did well. So the, I mean, the honky tonk man you shoots are you know the the litmus test for the series to show you that that it it it, it works. Uh, the Tony Atlas one, I'm a very big fan of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. a lot of rewatchability. Um, <laughs> Of Cor Corny's show, Missy Hyatt's show. It, it was, th there were so many good ones. Yeah. And I want to give a shout out to X Pop, Kevin Nash, and Perry Saturn. X Pop. Yeah. X Pop too. Yeah. Love, love those three. Uh, especially with Kevin Nash's being, you know, it, it, you broadened it, you, you did cutaways and all that stuff. I loved it. Um, the last one here, I thought this was the nicest way to end you shoot with Sean Oliver. Jason Worthing says this. Dear Sean, this is a thank you as well as a couple of questions. I wanted to say thank you for all the years of entertainment. Thank you for allowing me to sit in on the Jim Cornette breaking kayfabe. Kayfabe commentaries put out some of the best wrestling shoot content. Now onto the questions. For those of us who haven't read your books, which I strongly suggest you do, who was your most demanding and difficult talent to work with and who to this day still owes your company money from being stood up? And I'll ask the other question after you answer that. 
Well, the, you know, everyone knows, you know, Conan took his deposit and he's uh, the, the worst thing about that was it would have been a great show. It would have been a great guest booker. Um, you know, uh, he references the book. So he's talking about the Buff Bagwell story, which, you know, I, uh, it's, it's very well disappointing. Yep. That did not go as planned. And uh, there was another part of that. What was it? Uh, who owes us money? Uh, just, just yeah, those two, yeah, it was just that. Yeah. Um, and uh, lastly, he says, uh, oh, well, I mean, you've already kind of answered it, but any talent that you wish you could work with, but never had the chance. Well, I guess, yeah. yeah. Pat, maybe Pat, maybe Dusty. Yeah, certainly those two. Yeah. And Vince, Vince, I would have gotten a oh, great interview. Right. That would have been great. Absolutely. Uh, and he lastly says, thank you again for the many years of dedication from you and your crew, Jason Worthing. So uh, a shout out to Jason. He's a wonderful human being. A serviceman thanking me for my service. <laughs> okay. Down, commander. <laughs> okay, Sean. So now we're done with you shoot. And now we're going on to five second friends. So you have five seconds to answer each question. Uh, even if you break the five seconds, it's okay. But, uh, you know, most of the time we have wrestlers on the show, so they need more than five seconds to answer anything. But I, I'm, I'm confident that you'll be able to do this. Uh, first question, Sean Oliver, who is your favorite wrestler? Piper. What's your favorite match in wrestling history? Uh, Snooker Morocco cage match. Cool. Uh, your favorite book? Uh, wrestling related or, or anything? Or... Yeah, I'll say Pet Cemetery. It was the first novel that I read as a as a sixth grader, a young impressionable sixth grader. So uh, Pet Cemetery. Very nice. Uh, I know this might be tough for you, but favorite TV show? All time. All time. Taxi. Awesome. Uh, favorite film? <sighs> One. Uh, I'll give you a top, top few, uh, Raging Bull, Crimes and Misdemeanors. Uh, we'll put those two up there. Okay, cool, bro. Uh, your favorite musical artist? <sighs> All time, any genre? Uh, yep. uh, Eddie Van Halen. Oh, brilliant, bro. Excellent. May you rest in peace. Uh, your favorite food, Sean? Chicken tikka masala. If I can get to Indian... Um, if not, I like a really spicy seafood fra diavolo. <laughs> Very gravy. <nice. laughs> uh, favorite place to eat on the road? <sighs> Cracker Barrel. Nice. We get that uh, a little bit. Um, favorite alcoholic beverage? Old fashioned. Nice. Uh, favorite female body part? Uh, Are there any that are bad? I, they're all wonderful. <laughs> so maybe you're saying the whole package? Yeah. Yeah, we've had that before. Nikita Koloff says he, he likes the shape of a woman. That's very nice, I think. But the overall, like the distant uh, putting it all togetherness of it, yeah. Very nice. And the last one here on Five Second Frenzy, Sean, your favorite curse word? Um, you know, I say, all right, the one I say, it's not my favorite, but the one I say the most when something falls, when I drop something, I say your mother's fat fucking ass <laughs> and in the wrong company, it's, it could be a mistake. <laughs> I believe that's the first time we've had that answer on the show. So, uh, uh usually we just get fucked, but, um, that's, that's really, uh, that's quite something. So Sean, Again, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, sitting down with me and doing this interview. This has been so awesome for me. As I said at the beginning, you've been an inspiration for me. You, you've you've given me so many hours of content that I was so excited to to watch. It reminded me of how I felt when it was going to be Monday Night Raw in 1998, 1999. It reminded me of that feeling like the anticipation. Here we go. I'm going to learn something. Something's about to happen. Uh, that's where I, that's what I get from it. So from the most isolated city in the world, Perth, Western Australia, your biggest fan lives right here. 
Thank you, Carl. And uh, it's good to get down to Australia. So uh, I'm happy I could have flown back there this morning. Be well. <laughs> thank you, Sean. And thank you, everyone out there for watching here. The Insider's Edge podcast on the WCWA Network. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California, with my new friend, Sean Oliver, and we will see you next time. Thank you.